This presentation was recorded at the 2015 ANZICS ACCCN Annual Scientific Meeting. And our final speaker in this session is Liz Crow, who's an advanced clinician. Liz is well known, I'm sure, to the audience here already from having done a number of talks, and I gather there's a few more to go, but as advanced clin clinician social worker at not the Mater Children's Hospital, but the new Lady, well, still new, Lady Salento Children's Hospital. Uh, she's involved in research and uh, is an integral part of the um, social work support team at Lady Salento. Well, isn't it good to be the last speaker before lunch on such a cheery topic? I actually decided this morning to change this somewhat, having looked at the other speakers, because I think we talk about loss and grief all the time, and I'm not actually sure that we're talking the same language. So... In the book, A Fault in Our Stars, for any of you who've read it by John Green, I read it two Christmases ago and cried every day that I read it. My little voice kept saying, but you're on holidays. You're not supposed to cry on holidays, Mum. But he says, grief does not change you. It actually reveals you. And I think that's true. And I think sometimes what we idealise about ourselves when we're grieving or what we, the kind of things we push on to families is quite unfair because... When families are suffering, when anyone is suffering, you don't get resources, you often lose resources. And so we need to be really careful about how we predict what people should do. And I think in intensive care or anywhere in Western the world, it's very hard to grieve right. So if people cry too much, like if people cry in our unit, the social worker gets called straight away. It's like their child's dying, they're probably a bit upset. Um, and if people don't cry at all, we get called because they're in denial. And I think that there's a lot invested in grieving right because I 100% believe that one of the reasons that Lindy Chamberlain, who was allegedly a dingo took her baby at Ayers Rock many years ago, one of the reasons Lindy Chamberlain went to jail was because she didn't grieve properly, ever. She also had a bloody terrible accent which put everyone off and she belonged to what was then termed to be a funny religion. But she didn't grieve properly. She stood very stoically on the steps at all times and spoke about what had happened. So I think there's a lot invested in, in people about grieving properly. And today, in today's society, nothing breaks my heart more than when a bereaved mother, day two, is given antidepressants. Now, grief can absolutely turn into depression, but grief is very raw and start particularly parental bereavement and we need to be very careful not to try and contain people by giving them antidepressants. <coughs> so what are we even talking about when we talk about loss? Well essentially it's where you perceive something in your life to be negative. The world you know has changed and the thing about loss is that it can happen during really joyful times as well. So when you get married, you can be very happy and excited, but kind of sad at the same time that hopefully, or maybe, you'll never kiss someone else again. I often think about being a new mother. I had wanted to be a mother since I was very small. I was one of those really maternal children. Every photo of me, you know, as a child, I have a, a baby on my hip. And I remember being so excited when I gave birth. But the first time I got out of the shower at home and I saw a massive pad in underpants that were about this big and you're leaking from everywhere, you do have a moment where you think, what have I done to my body? And so losses can run very jointly along with great joys. And I'm always very careful to say to our families who've just had a neonatal, you know, just given birth and they end up in PICU, to talk about the child's name and to say congratulations and did they know the gender because they're, they're trying to integrate this great joy with this great loss. So what is grief? Well, it's actually your physical and emotional reaction to a loss. And again, in the Western world, if you cry too much, you're depressed. If you don't cry enough, you're, you know, you're in denial. But there's a million ways that we grieve. Who here is a comfort eater? I always say, you don't get to ask like this from salad. You know, like, you know, a lot of people get great comfort from food. But what about those people who get stressed and get really thin? You know, we use food as a reward and a loss thing all of the time. Lots of men don't cry. 
And some of that is very sociological because they don't want, they think that might make them gay or they think that, you know, it means you're weak. But there's some evidence to show that some of that may actually be scientific. That when progesterone rises, it can actually um, block the hormone that creates tears. And so you'll often hear men say, I feel like crying and I can't. And some well-intentioned idiot woman will say, you're not trying hard enough. <laughs> so we need to be very careful that we're not making judgments about how people grieve. Because I see lots of men in our unit just shut down and they watch TV, which can look like they don't care. But all of us have our own very different style of how we grieve. So what's sorrow? I, I couldn't find a good definition for that because sorrow is just that deep distress often that follows loss. And it's a form of grieving as well. And I like this little saying, sorrow is too great to exist in small hearts. And sometimes I like to say to people when they are grieving, you know, as, as tragic as this is, it means that you are living a life full of love. That's what losses are about, usually a pretty blessed life. So what is chronic sorrow? Because lots of people haven't heard this term before. And actually, Alansky turned this in 1962, around the same time that Kubler-Ross started the five stages, but it has never gained great knowledge. And chronic sorrow is really, it was first termed around parents who had children with disabilities, recognising that their losses will be continual and many that their losses start at diagnosis, the losses increase with each hospital admission, each failure to reach a developmental milestone. And the, the, the thing about chronic sorrow is people have to remain active and engaged all the time. And we see chronic sorrow starting in the PICU all the time, don't we, with those new babies that are getting one diagnosis after another. But these parents don't have time to grieve. They've got to take in information and learn new terms and be very active advocates for their own families. And chronic sorrow continues until death, and then it becomes bereavement. And I think we're about to see, I think, a real widening of this term, because we'll see, you know, anyone who has any long trajectory become chronic sorrow. And I was doing this talk, and I thought, how much of what we do has elements of chronic sorrow? It doesn't mean we're burnt out. It doesn't mean that we're done for. It just means that sometimes we have this cumulative grief that goes on in PICU. And then there's compassion fatigue. And that's basically when you just feel like you give and 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 sometimes there's nothing left in the tank. It's completely curable but it's often a good time to have a holiday, good time to not be doing nights, good time to maybe have a mental health day, only do that very rarely. Um, but it's really about, you know, as health professionals, we are professional commiserators. My children say to me all the time, how do you do that? Because we can be like fourth in line at the grocery store and I'll say to the checkout lady, how's your day going? And she's like, <laughs> I must just have something about me that says cry, I can cope. I'm forever writing out referrals. But you know, if I asked you, who here in the audience was the person at school that everyone came to when someone broke up with someone? Someone had a fight with their mother. You know, we are professional commiserators. Often we have been doing this for a hell of a long time, where nurture is by nature. And I like this quote that says, I think this can reply, you know, apply to any health professional, particularly in critical care. The real essence of what we do is not the mechanical details of execution, but the creative imagination, the sensitive spirit, and the understanding behind these skills. Without these, the intellectual and spiritual elements are subordinated to the mechanical and the means becomes more important than the ends. Lots of people can learn the technique of what we need to do in terms of func you know, managing machines. But that real connection, that sacred bond that often exists with us with absolute strangers, that, that rapport that can happen really fast, that's what makes it unique. Now, Kubler-Ross did an enormous amount for the loss and grief literature and community and understanding. But when Kubler-Ross wrote about the five stages of grief, it was never meant to be around bereavement. It was around diagnosis of cancer. And then as she actually got older in her life and actually got sick herself, she said that she no longer really found that this was relevant. And yet everywhere in the literature, it's still spoken about. There is no authoritative roadmap here for what happens when people grieve. People may go through many of those stages, but if you look at things like denial, it's a really healthy way to help your brain 
accept something that's overwhelming. It's almost like it lets it trickle in a little bit at a time so that people can slowly absorb how their lives have changed. You know, in terms of anger, when we have bereaved families, sometimes when there's a big child protection case in the media, a number of our bereaved families from even, you know, six, seven years ago will ring because they'll say, how is it that there can be parents who torture their child to death and we were loving parents and our child still died? So that anger can come back at any time. People often don't even understand what bargaining is. It's often when you're trying to negotiate with the universe or a higher power. You know when you're running late for work and you're like, I need the green, I need the green. You know, you just need that, oh, I swear I'm going to give you something good today, universe, if you just let that light stay green. It's the same thing where people are saying, I'm begging you, don't let this happen. Don't take my child. I will be better. I will be hum more humble. I will adopt 52 orphan children. You know, we're trying to bargain because what's happening is so overwhelming. I don't agree with the depression. I think lots of people will suffer, they'll have grief, but not everyone will have depression, not even after a death. And in all of my years of working with so many hundreds of families who've lost a child, I don't think I agree with acceptance either. I think lots of people get to a meaning-making stage where they can say, I wish this never happened and I would take it all back in a heartbeat. But I've been able to do this or understand it. And we see that really publicly all the time. You know, like Walter Minkoff, whose children and wife were killed in the Port Arthur, now has a big foundation. You know, the amount of people who have foundations or, you know, run marathons or whatever, they're trying to make meaning, building schools after their own children have died. One of the big problems that I have with Kubler-Ross's five stages is that it doesn't explore that we grieve as a whole world. When Princess Diana died, where did that fit in the five stages of grief when people who had never met the woman were distressed? I've got to tell you, I've got to go to the side and tell you a very funny story. So children are very concrete grievers. And this woman gave me this great example. She said that the day that Princess Diana died, they had it on the radio. And uh, she started crying and was saying, I can't believe Diana's dead. And her husband, they were Australian, her husband's teasing and going, why do you care? You never met the woman. And she's like, I don't know, she was just the Princess of Wales. She was such a... And next minute, their six-year-old daughter burst into tears. She's sobbing into her cereal going, I can't believe the Princess of Wales has died. And her mother said, we, we didn't even know she, you knew who she was. She said, yes, I did. I'm just so worried. And they said, what are you worried about? And she said, the Princess of Wales has died. Who's going to feed all the dolphins and fish now? Children are very concrete grievers because the Princess of Wales is obviously a big mammal that swims in the sea. <laughs> the other thing is, is that when you follow Kubler-Ross, it ignores the alternative ways that people grieve. People can be very creative. Um, what's the guy's name whose kid fell out the window and he's saying, stairway to heaven? Thank you. You know, that was an expression of grief. There's nothing in the Kubler-Ross Five Stages that kind of says that. It's also very Western and white. There's a whole Eastern spiritual, cultural way of grieving that doesn't follow those five steps. And it doesn't accept that sometimes we have to grieve as a couple or we have to grieve as a family. Sometimes we grieve as a picky unit. It doesn't fit with five stages. C.S. Eliot said, Nobody told me that grief was so much like fear. For any of you who have ever suffered an enormous loss, it's terrifying. Everything you thought you knew about the way you coped with the world sort of crumbles beneath you. And you really feel like you'll never be happy or normal or joyful or content or stable or secure again. So what does normal grief look like? I get asked this all the time. That would be like saying, what does a normal human being look like? One of my colleagues who's six foot eight put his hand up the other day and I said, mate, you are not normal. <laughs> you know, it, it's like saying, what's a normal food? What's a normal joke? You know, for people who work in critical care, what we find funny, <laughs> most of the rest of the world thinks we should be locked up for laughing about. So grief has this whole range of ways of being expressed that's, that can never be written in a list because human nature is so individual. So what does grief look like for parents? And I think when we talk about grief in Piku, we always go to the extreme of death. 
Whereas we have hundreds of families who come through our unit who grieve that don't have a child who die. So we do know that for parents who do have a child die, that parental bereavement is the most profound known grief, is what they say. Most profound. But what about just the loss of a parenting role? What about never getting to celebrate that you've had a baby? Instead, it's whisked away with an undiagnosed cardiac condition and put on ECMO, and you, the first cuddle went to a nurse or went to a surgeon. Not that surgeons are cuddling, holding. Let's call it holding. <laughs> Assumptive world theory is that every day we have this list and build of assumptions of what we think is going to happen today. So, you know, this morning I got up and I thought, I'm going to go to the gym and then I'm going to go to breakfast and then I'm going to come here and I'm going to do a talk. Instead, I woke up rather hungover. I didn't go to the gym. My assumptive world was shattered by too many Red Bulls and vodkas last night. But, it, but essentially, assumptive world is you believe you know what the world is going to be. If we went and asked the people of Christchurch prior to the earthquake that day, what did you think was going to happen to you that day? and then what actually happened to them, their whole assumptive world was literally shattered. They will never get up again in their lives and not fear tremors wherever they live. So that's what it is to have an assumptive world shattered. Parents who find themselves in Piku will never believe that loss can't come and knock at their door. They will never believe that your child can't be taken from you. They will never believe that their children are 100% safe. We have our assumptive world shattered too, I think, just by working this in this world. I think we're all much more likely to... I know I never let my kids go to sleep fighting with me, even if they hate me. I need to tell them how much I love them. I never let them go to sleep, you know, go anywhere. I never let them go anywhere without saying, go, don't need water, fire, pencils, food. Mm -hmm. What we're asking of parents is to surrender their power to strangers. How terrifying would that be? Even if we knew all the stuff, if one of my children ended up in Piku, I would still really grieve having to surrender that power to my colleagues. And they're known and trusted and loved. And what must it be like to have every movement, movement assessed, judged, written in a chart, recorded, who here would like their marriage, their relationship, their interactions with their own parents recorded? I freaking wouldn't. You know, like we are so judgmental, formulating judgments all the time. That is a massive loss experience for parents. Are we as health professionals even allowed to grieve what we do at work? So often I hear these terrible statements often coming from leaders in our hospitals or executives where people are saying, oh, did you hear that four nurses have asked to go to that funeral? That's such a crossing of boundaries. Is it? So what? I, I'm often amused that we're allowed to tell people that their children have died. We're allowed to bath and hold a dead child and to brush its hair and to plait it and to put it into clothes, but then to go to a, a funeral is a crossing of a boundary. Our job is a crossing of a boundary. Starting hearts, stopping hearts, looking inside people, surgery. You know, these are intrusive, intimate things that we do all of the time. Now, you can't be friends with families on Facebook. That's actually a dangerous, profound, you know, professional boundary. And I'll tell you why, because at some stage you may not want to be their friend on Facebook. Once you've opened that door and crossed a line, it's very hard to come back. And it's very hard to know where it's going to lead. But to go to a funeral and stand in the back and, and give the very clear message to a family, your child mattered, is a gift. It's not a professional boundary. We can't do it all of the time, but when we can't, we still send heartfelt messages. The other day I was evaluating some of my emails and I think the language I use is heartfelt. I genuinely care. I want that to be communicated. I don't want families to think that their child and they have been forgotten. So are we allowed to grieve? 
In our hospital, we have been doing formal debriefing as well as informal debriefing for some time. But I still find it really funny what people find is acceptable. You know, when you walk out and someone will go, oh, so-and-so was upset. I'm not sure what that was about. Ah, uh, sadness. It was about sadness. I want you to feel sad. Feeling sad is not not being resilient. It's not not coping. Feeling sad is being a human being. I would hope that we very much hold on to that humanity and embrace those emotions when they come without judgment because it's important. You know, long after we forget these families, they know you. They remember the smell of your perfume. They remember what you were wearing and what you said. We have profound interactions with these people. We need to be able to grieve them. And so there's a term called disenfranchised grief. And it's basically about when we have a grief that can't be acknowledged or sanctioned properly um, in society. And I think a lot of the grief that health professionals have in PICU is disenfranchised grief. Now, the, the story I normally tell to help people understand what disenfranchised grief was there was a professional cricketer called David Boone. Is that right? Yeah. David Boone, who got a punch in the head. Is that the guy? Hooks. I knew it wasn't Boone. Boone, he's the dude. Um, David Hooks got punched outside of a pub and was, you know, severe brain injury, was declared brain death. And his wife came forward and said, we'd like to donate his organs. And there was a very big thing. And then they started the David Hooks Foundation. And we have a thing on our ABC called The Australian Story, where four months later, his girlfriend, who'd lived with him for three years, came forward and said what the experience had been like after living with this man, not to be in the media, not to allowed to go to ICU, because he'd never divorced his wife, so she had all the legal rights. Now, David had seemed to have had an interesting history of trading down, trading up to younger blonde women, um, and that had happened several times in his life. But his his current girlfriend got completely excluded, so that's disenfranchised grief. People who have to have a termination or people who have a miscarriage is often disenfranchised grief. What we experience in PICU, I think, is disenfranchised grief because we often don't feel like we can share with our family and friends, either because we don't want to burden them or because of confidentiality or because we're just confused about our own feelings or because you have a husband who wants to fix things so when you come home and cry about work, they go, well, just leave. <laughs> Not helpful. That's disenfranchised grief. So what is staff grief for us? I'm going to run out of time. What time is it? Just no idea. All right. Um, <laughs> yay! The crickets are in the background. It's night time. I'll just keep going. All right. So I think for PICU staff, our grief can be very individual. And we do know that when people um, have a personal loss going on at home, we're likely to absorb the grief a lot harder at work. It's almost like when your resources are depleted, your filter for being able to protect yourself gets, gets kind of stripped away. So our grief can be very individual. Our grief can be really collective. You know, the staff that were on that day who met that family, we share this unique kind of relationship with each other. I often say with our consultants, like, I'm their wife during the week that they're on, and I say it's like a real marriage because we don't have sex. But we have this lovely relationship with my, our consultants that I know by their facial expressions where they're going with conversations. I know during resuscitations what I need to be saying to families just by looking at them because I've worked with them for that long. So, you know, our grief can be very collective and that can be just four or five of us or when we've had someone who's been in our unit or in and out of our unit or someone we know, we can grieve as a whole unit. I think the unit never grieves more than when we have child protection cases. And certainly my PhD research would be indicating that child protection cases are the things that actually really painfully hurt staff more than any, any other cases. And our grief can be really cumulative. It annoys me and I find it very hard personally to know how to respond when someone goes, I couldn't do your job, but I guess you're kind of used to it. Yeah, we don't care when kids die anymore. It's just like, oh, that's just another one. Um, no. That's not what happens. Grief can be very cumulative. And there will be 
those children, those families, that mother, that grandmother, whatever, that just you make that special connection with every now and then. And sometimes you're not even sure why, but just, you know, sometimes you just have that feeling with the family that you think, oh, though, like if I met you at a barbecue, I would have liked to have been your friend or there's just something about them or that, you know, they've had a hard life and you just want to love them for a bit while they're in there. And so I think our grief can be cumulative. And sometimes, I don't know if you have this experience driving to work where you just think, not today. <laughs> Please, universe, I am tired. Not today. And that's always the day there'll be a big MVA and a drowning come in and blah, 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 blah. Oh, the universe is a tricker, isn't it? All right. So I think for Piku staff, we go through this constant motion of grieving and avoiding, grieving and avoiding. And I think what we probably need to get better at doing is grieving, being curious about it, understanding it. <laughs> grieving, being curious, understanding. Because you have to have that self-knowledge, that self-awareness, so that you know when you're in trouble. You know, I say to people, the time to pay attention to your own well-being is today. It's not when you're having migraines, thinking about changing career, crying on the way to work. You're, you have to pay attention to your well-being every single day. We have to keep it, you know, just our job is very physical. For any of you who have ever worn a Fitbit to work, to see how many kilometres you do each day, when we went to the new Lady Salento Children's Hospital, uh, they put all the alerts as a big red button that looked like a clown this high. And the social workers run with the MET team. 33 MET calls first day of the hospital. 16 kilometres we did. None of them real. 11 to the same room. <laughs> so what we do requires it's a lot of physical and emotional energy and we need to be tapped into that and aware of it all the time. And in terms of our own grief, there's very little leadership about that. Do you know that formal debriefing happens very rarely in any hospital in the world? But the police do it. The ambulance do it. Most emergency services do it. The military do it as routine. They also all get psychological testing, real preparation for what the job does. For us, you just have to have a degree and write something good on paper and away we go. It's very silly. All right, I thought we should finish this session with fun. Let's talk about gender and grief. I think that it'd be wrong to be you know, to stereotype grief. But I think sometimes it's good to talk about how does the stereotypical woman grieve and the stereotypical man grieve because it's important that we have some understanding about that. And it's important that we talk about it because what inevitably happens is that children end up in our piku, women are wailing and weeping, everyone feels very comfortable to comfort them. If the man cries, they're like, oh, could he not look after her? Does he have to make it about himself? If he doesn't cry, we're like, oh, how hard is he? Does he not get what's going on? So I think, you know, when we actually have some real knowledge that's, that's backed up by neuroscience and what we actually know to be true, we can share that education with families. And so we can say to them, what you're doing is normal. You don't have to fear it. It doesn't mean that your marriage is going to break down. There is nothing in the research Despite what you read and people say, there is no conclusive evidence that bereaved families are more likely to get divorced. 33% of the population gets divorced. Bereaved families still fall very much in those normal range. All right, so Doka first talked about this whole, instead of saying men and women, we'll talk about intuitive and instrumental. So intuitive grievers are people who cry. Intuitive grievers are very emotional and often want to discuss what's going on. Instrumental grievers are people who are much more action-based. And if we look at things, I always say to people, look at things from an evolutionary process. Why is it that we may have evolved that men don't cry? Now, I know there were no saber-toothed tigers when there were human beings, but I'm just going to give you a little example. I don't need you to tell me that. But let's just say there were saber-toothed tigers. When people were around the campsite, women and children were together, talking, 
nurturing, looking out for one another. There was a sense of community. Men went out without mobile phones, with a stick and a dumb bit of rock on the end to fight a massive saber-toothed tiger. They had to spread out, be quiet, be very focused on one thing at a time, not multitasking. Huh? <laughs> Evolution. They're quietly coming. If it had been us, women, I would have been like, what was that? <laughs> oh my God, I'm starving. <laughs> Come and stand closer to me. Safety in numbers. You know, I would have been noisy. I would have been chatting. And after a while, I probably would have started to cry. I'm cold. I'm ring a man. Men couldn't do that. They had to be very focused, very still. That, that's how we evolved. That's how we evolved. It's frustrating, but it's how we evolved. So that's what he was saying. And if you look at grief, so are people here old enough to know Little House on the Prairie? There was a TV show called Little House on the Prairie. I love Little House on the Prairie. <laughs> I, I haven't seen it either. I, got, I hide out the DVDs. Um, so in it, there was a, Doc Wilson, I think his name was. When something happened, so like if Laura Ingalls got kicked in the head by a horse, They'd call for Doc Wilson, he would come flying down the hill on his horse and then he'd get there and just look. He had nothing. He had a stethoscope, he couldn't do anything, he wasn't going to measure intracranial pressures, he wasn't going to ventilate, he just put them on a table and they all sat around. Now if Laura Ingalls died, all the women would come and they would bring food and they would prepare the body and they would weep and mourn together. But what the men would do is they'd go down and chop down a tree. And then they'd scrape the bark and they'd build a coffin. And then they would dig by hand for hours and make a grave and, and bury. All of the women's rituals actually remain. What rituals do men still have? Do you know that if you want to build your own coffin, even if you're a carpenter, you have to get a special warrant because of workplace health and safety and leakage and everything else. We've taken a lot of the male rituals away. So that's probably how we ended up with some intuitive grievers and some instrumental grievers. There's some real sociological reasons why men and women grieve differently. Women, socially, are often more competent at networks. How does that happen? I'll tell you. Little girls' games, stereotypically, right, involve lots of talking. Dressing up, oh, you look beautiful, you should try this. Oh, Bobby, Ken is so handsome, let's go over here and talk. Let's share this, you know, just talking, John Becker, the children. Um, you know, so they're all, it's all conversing, tea parties, nurturing babies. So when I had boys, I've got two boys, I had three brothers, I was sure I was going to have little women, no, two boys. I was determined to have this gender neutral environment. So we had wooden dress up toys and you know wooden toys and we had no guns, we had nothing that was violent and I was very strict about the TV and my eldest son Noah, everyone used to compliment me on what a sensitive, intelligent little boy we were, he was and I would be like, this is my parenting so good at this you know all the boys were being rough and he was never rough I remember one day someone threw sand in his face and he came over and said I have sand in my face no retaliation I was like oh, such a good boy and then one day I was driving down the road he's about two and a half and he said mum mum see that lady walking on the side of the road I think she's dead and I said why would you say that darling and he said because I just shot her with a big gun <laughs> I just went straight up the curve. I was like, no, we don't, we don't say that. And from that moment on, the toilet roll was a gun, like the pegs were a gun. He wanted to wrestle and fight. It was just like bubbling out of him. He turned into this, you know, Martin Bryant psycho killer. I just didn't know what had happened. Boys like games that are action-based. You know, even if you see two kids, boys playing PlayStation or something, they don't speak to each other. They just play for hours and end, don't speak. If you've ever had a partner that fishes, right, they can go on a boat for 12 hours and they come home and they go, and you can say to your husband, so has Daniel's wife started the new job yet? Oh, I didn't ask her. Ah, uh, you know, how's his son's leg going now that it's been broken? Oh, we didn't talk about that. It's like, uh, what's happening with the renovations? Oh, we didn't talk about that. It's like, what did you talk about? We were fishing. 
I can go away with my three, you know, my friends from school for three days and we're still ringing each other on the phone after we've left because I, I forgot to tell them something. You know, it's a different thing. So when we have a grief event, you know, we are very practiced at phoning and asking for help and sharing feelings. My friends have seen me cry, they've seen me, you know, there's nothing we haven't done together. Men often haven't had that experience. And what do we do as women? We say, go and support your brother-in-law. It's such an awkward moment. You know what I'm talking about. Men are at the thing and some woman has sent her husband, sent him in to Piku to look after his friend. They get there and they go, g'day mate. He goes, g'day pretty bad. Yes. <laughs> That's it. They've got nothing. They have never practiced. Now, I'm being very stereotypical, but they can still, men can still be grieving very hard without crying. A men's style of grief is as valid as any other. We can't look for it, but what happens is if we are looking for it, in a traditional sense, they make get no source of comfort. And if you put one bereaved father in a group of bereaved mothers in a group, they will look after all the women. They'll never speak about themselves. Now, is the next generation going to be different? I don't know. Maybe yes, maybe no. And even though it's frustrating for us that they can't multitask and it's frustrating that they can't talk about their feelings, if you've ever dated a guy that doesn't, talk, doesn't shut up about his feelings, it's annoying. <laughs> no, it is. My husband's a social worker. It's so annoying. So be careful what you wish for. <laughs> Dave Formby is a police counsellor and he said to me, I know this is a four-legged stool, it's very hard to get a photo of a three-legged stool, but he said to me, you know, Liz, men are like a bar stool, a three-legged bar stool. They're protector, provider and procreator, which means they like to have sex. If you chop off one of those legs, the bar stool falls over. Now, the other thing, I'm, I am going to finish in a minute. The other thing I just wanted you to tell you, I'm going to talk about sex at a conference. Yes. <laughs> so, because men are often not very practiced at talking about grief, when they're distressed, they want to be close to their partner. That's what they want. The best way they know how to do that is to have sex. So, we see these couples going through a crisis and you know, they've been up for 40 hours straight and you send them over to Ronald McDonald House and they leave and he's got his hand on her back and they walk up. 15 minutes later, the doors come storming open. She comes to the desk and she's like, can you believe what that pig just did? <laughs> Our daughter is fighting for her life on a ventilator and he just tried to have sex with me. <laughs> and all the nurses are like, that asshole. <laughs> and then he comes back like this. <clears throat> Now, there is some real research coming out about this. That is just their only way of being close. Their only way to know how to connect. Now, the problem is with women, now take notes on this, John Becker, <laughs> that women want to feel close to a man. We want to be a little bit dated. You know, we want to be wooed. We want people to acknowledge us. Just wash up. But one of the best things that I ever heard as a new mother... No, what? seriously, I heard this at a mother's group. She said, if my husband vacuums, I have sex with him within about two hours. And she's like, floors always spotless. It's like Pavlov's dogs. <laughs> Try it. You want a task done? Pavlov's dogs. But seriously, it's really... So women, you know, we want to feel an emotional connection in order to want to be physically close to our partners. Men want to be physically close to their partner and then sometimes if they're not asleep, they will talk to you. <laughs> so just remember that it's much more important to connect with the person in front of you and see who they are. There are men who cry. That doesn't mean they don't have great testosterone. They're not real men. It just means that they're emotional. They might be more intuitive grievers. And I have one of my closest girlfriends is a very instrumental griever. In like the 30 years that I've known her, which meant, you know, we only met as babies. Um, she, I've never seen her cry. It's not her style. People can still be grieving very, very heavily. Um, Thank you. Thank you very much.
it, Liz. It's extraordinary to see a talk where everybody in the room is just nodding furiously all the way through it. <laughs> and it's particularly nice to have some uh, normalisation of male responses. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's an opportunity for some... Uh, do you want to come up, um, the other speakers? Um, we are over time, so we've possibly only got time for a question or two. Um, but are there people with questions? Fiona? Liz, can I ask you about debriefing? Because um, there's a lot of research that says that actually debriefing is destructive for people because it makes them relive things without necessarily moving anywhere forward and can become quite self-indulgent. But you seem to be presenting as something that should be happening. And I think supervision is different from debriefing, which is what I think those other groups are doing. But I just want to ask about whether debriefing is really useful. Yep. So what happened was Cochrane did a review on psychological debriefing. So in the 90s, everyone was doing this critical incident stress debriefing um, by Mitchell, and it was very popular and it was going very well. And then Cochrane did a review on debriefing where the over overall message was debriefing very bad. If you actually look at that Cochrane review, out of the 18 or so um, papers that they actually looked at, what they were looking at was compulsory attendance at debriefing, and most of them were um, like victims of sexual abuse. So they were rape victims who had to attend a psychological debriefing of six sessions. And what they found, not surprisingly, is hearing about other people's rapes was not a healing process for themselves. If you look at the Cochrane Review, the three that were more around critical incident stress debriefing, three of them had positive outcomes and two had had no difference. People were no better off and no worse. So my issue with that is when you look at what people are actually measuring in debriefing, they're often measuring PTSD. So before they measure it and then they do the debriefing and they measure it afterwards. No difference. So why do psychological debriefing? We don't have friggin' D PTSD. That's not what we have. If you want to do critical psychological debriefing, it's really about what happened in terms of process. So we're looking at a medical process. And then we're looking at the emotional events of that. Often if you go through the medical process first, people are so relieved to know that they didn't kill the child. We don't even need to do the emotional stuff. It's already been resolved for them along the way. But we have a very strict process. I've just received a research grant. We're just about to start formalising it. And so hopefully we'll have some papers out next year. But um, we've been doing it for about eight years. And our little team... It got such good reputation we were getting asked to the adults and the mother mothers as well outside our own scope of practice. But it was we, we follow a very strict procedure and it's not compulsory. And it's not, you know, it's a one-off. And if all the staff can't get there, we'll have a second one, but the first group don't come to the second group unless they want to. Does that answer your question? Have we got one more question before we head for lunch? They're just hungry. <laughs> I'm quite curious to know what the five temptations were. Yes, so was we, I. What are they? Do you know <laughs> we can finish with that. Um, just so we're all prepared. No, no I, I'm afraid I don't know them all, but uh, there were temptations uh, by the devil. The, the woodcuts had the devils tempting the dying per person. Um, one was obviously to um, worldly goods, you know, the, the horse, the house, the, the wine. Um, and I'm afraid I don't know the others. I'll, I'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> I can tweet it. Yeah, OK. <laughs> OK, well, I mean, that was a fantastic session. I'd ask everyone to join me in thanking all the speakers.